everybody. You are welcome to this webinar, which is the August edition of our monthly workshop. It's a great pleasure to have you on board. This event is hosted by Rich Flood, a leading continental provider of environmental and social due diligence services for investments in Africa. The topic for discussion today is Resettlement Action Plan, which we call RAP. We are going to be discussing the planning, the implementation, and monitoring. When we say resettlement, it has to do with disruption and displacement of communities resulting from project-related land acquisition or restrictions on land use. Today, this workshop will provide vital information and guidance on the planning and execution of involuntary settlements, specifying the procedures that should be followed, as well as the actions to be taken to mitigate adverse effects and compensate losses. This workshop is segmented into two sessions, the morning and the afternoon session, and each session will last for one hour. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so as for you to know how to participate in today's event. First, this workshop will be recorded and made available on Rich Flood's YouTube channel. Secondly, all participants are in listen-only mode. Also, we would appreciate that each participant name themselves properly and add the organization in brackets after your name so that you can be properly identified, especially when you ask questions. And we want to implore you to send in your questions at any time during the presentations and our speakers, we address them during the question and answer session at the end of all the presentations. To do this, kindly utilize the chat box, which is located at the bottom of your screen on a computer and at the top of your screen on a tablet device. Please also do well to include your name and location alongside your questions or comments that you may have during the course of the presentation. Thank you for your participation. Right now, I would like to introduce the speakers who will be taking us through this session. Our first speaker for today, who will be contributing to the topic on that discourse is Mr. Dako, who is from the Mining Cadastra Office is the Assistant Director, Ministry of Mines and Steel Development. And he'll be taking us through the topic for today. And our second presenter we have is Mr. Ojo Sonde, who is a geologist and remote sensing expert. He has handled several projects on environmental assessment studies across Nigeria, including environmental audits, Resettlement Action Plan, Environmental Protection and Rehabilitation Program, and other studies at Bridge Flood International Limited. Right now, I would hand over to our first contributor, the person of Mr. Dakop, the Assistant Director, Mining Cadastra Office, Ministry of Mines and Steel Development, for his contribution. Thank you very much. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, this topic is apt in this time that we have various minefields and mining pits around that are causing very terrible situation in our environment. The 
The effects of mining degradation in our environment cannot be overemphasized. We are all witnesses to the awareness, to the adverse effect that the mining activities has caused by leaving dangerous gullies and mine pits, which would have been covered but were left uncovered. These dangerous pits are not only detrimental to human activities, but even to animals alike, especially the grazing animals. In an ideal situation, these mining pits, after the mining activities, would have been closed such that we will not have these effects on our environment. But most at times, whether on the part of the mining company or on the part of government that could not enforce the company to operate and close out all the mines activity, I mean the mines degradation that has been left behind. Most of these things are found everywhere in our environment. If you go to areas where mines activities, mining activities happen, you will find this dangerous scenario everywhere. And these are very uncalled for environments that would have been avoided. We find out that in the Mining Act, there is a place for uh, mines reclamation. And mines reclamation and tells that every mining activity after the close of mines would be reclaimed and is enshrined in the law such that all companies supposed to adhere to it, but most of the times the companies are only after their benefits. When they are done with mining, they are looking elsewhere to find the minerals that they are looking for forgetting that the environment can also be useful after the mines activities. And when left uncovered, they always cause a lot of harm. And most of the times, even farming activities cannot be able to be carried out there because of the degradation. And this is causing a lot of havoc to our environment. In fairness, the government supposed to enforce this on every mining company to be able to cover all the, the pits that has been docked by them in the course of finding the minerals. And after that, when they are covered, other activities on the surface can also take place. But sometimes, whether negligence on the side of the company or lack of enforcement by the government, most of these companies will just leave the, uh, the mine pits without reclaiming them. We can go on and on with the effects of these activities on our environment. But I want to pause here so that we will continue later when other colleagues will have their own contributions to this topic. So I welcome you all and I ask that 
everybody should use his time to ask questions where the need arises. And I'm ready and I'm here for you to answer some of these questions. Thank you and God bless. Thank you very much, sir. That was brief, but informative. Um, right about now, we would like to bring in this fund contributor for his own uh, presentation as well. Mr. Ojo Sonde, over to you, please. Thank you so much, moderator, for having me this morning. Good day, everyone. You are welcome to the second part of this morning session. And I will, uh, we also like to appreciate Mr. Dapo for that concise contribution. You have really dealt with the topics from your years of experience. However, you also take us through some of the basic and fundamental things we, know, we need to know about the topic of discussion, which is the settlement action plan as it relates to its planning, implementation, and the monitoring stages. My name is um, Jason De. And this is the presentation outline. I will start with introduction and um, I'll be taking us through the standard and regulatory frameworks that relates to the settlement action plan. And then we move on to the objectives of the settlement action plan and then the risk and the impact of poor settlement action, as well as the steps and the procedures that we need to follow when carrying out the settlement action plan and then the benefit of an effective resettlement action plan, and then we conclude from there. Um, you will agree with me, next slide please. You will agree with me that land is one of the major prerequisites and usually a precondition for constructing infrastructures that are needed for a development project. But if we look at it critically, we will observe that most often than not, the processes that are involved in acquiring land are not that easy. So if land acquisition processes are not well managed, it will definitely lead to very serious impact on the lives of the project affected persons, which can also result in the physical relocation and even disrupting their sources of income or the means of livelihood. So the general impact of physical and economic displacement on the people is what is known as involuntary resettlement. So putting it in a more technical way and um, adopting the definition that was given by the International Finance Corporation, the performance standard five of the IFC, involuntary resettlement is defined as the physical displacement, which is in terms of relocation or loss of shelter, and economic displacement, which is in terms of loss of assets or access to assets that leads to loss of income sources or some means of livelihood, which usually occur as a result of project related land acquisition. This is a widely accepted definition of involuntary resettlement. And then every year, every year, it has been reported that millions of people are always involuntarily displaced from their homes, from their lands, from their means of livelihood as a result, as a result of the project related activities in different parts of the world. And most of these displacement acts are usually against the fundamental human rights. And so that is why the resettlement action plan is being put forward in order to, meet, to minimize the negative impacts of involuntary resettlement. So going with the, with the definition that was given by the World Bank Operational Policy 4.12, the settlement action plan is referred to as the guidelines which specifies the procedures or the actions that a project sponsor or an investor must take to mitigate adverse effects, to compensate losses, and to provide development and benefits to persons and communities that are affected by an involuntary resettlement as a result of an investment project. So that is the technical definition that was given by the World Bank Operational Policy 4.12. And if we look at this definition critically, 
we can categorically say that the resettlement action plan is the main planning instrument for the resettlement process. And its major aim basically is to outline the proposed plan for the resettlement and address the risk and the impact that are associated with such involuntary resettlement. Because if by any means the resettlement action is poorly designed or poorly implemented, it will definitely have negative impact, not only on the communities or the project affected persons in the community, but also on the project itself. So it is important to state here that resettlement plans are usually project specific. It usually varies based on a lot of factors that are peculiar to a particular project, such as maybe the scale of the project, the lo local socioeconomic environment, as well as the complexity and the significance of the associated impact that are shifted with the particular project. So all these are the factors that determine the type of resettlement action plan that will take place and how it will take place. So moving forward, let's look at the different categories of resettlement that we have. Basically, we have basic four types of um, resettlement. We have a resettlement can either be voluntary or involuntary, and it can either be physical or economic. Voluntary resettlement is when the resettled household have the choice to move or otherwise. So in voluntary resettlement, the people involved, they have the choice to relocate or not. So that is for the voluntary resettlement. On the contrary, involuntary resettlement refers to the situation where the affected persons or the communities that are involved do not have the choice to refuse displacement. They just have to relocate that they like it or not, they don't have the choice to refuse. And when we say a resettlement is physical in nature, it means the loss of shelters or buildings or other forms of structures due to the activities of a development project that want to take place in that environment. And for the economic displacement, it basically means loss of assets or access to assets that we eventually lead to loss of income sources or other means of livelihood. So those are the four basic categories of um, resettlement that we have. All right, so moving ahead, let's quickly look at the standards and the regulatory frameworks that are related to resettlement planning, that are related to resettlement action plan. We have four basic types. We have the regulations that are international standard. We have those ones that are national. We have the industry specific policies, and we have the Companies corporate policy on resettlement. So those are the four main categories of standard and regulatory framework that guides the resettlement action plan. For the international standard, we have a whole lot of them. We have a whole lot of them, starting from the IFC, the International Finance Corporation Performance Standard Five which is on land acquisition and involuntary resettlement. And this particular standard is the most widely accepted international framework that governs resettlement activities, especially for private sector projects. So the ISC standard is regarded as the guiding standard in all sectors. So it covers all sectors, it covers all industries that are private sector in nature. Or, apart from the performance standard five of the um, IFC, we also have some other standards because we have about nine or 10 performance standards of IFC. So apart from the standard performance standard five, we have the standard one that also relate to resettlement action plan. The standard one is talking about the assessment and the management of environmental and social risk and impact. Also the standard seven, which talks about the indigenous people around a project. And then the performance standard eight talks about the cultural heritages. So that is for the um, IFC, the International Finance Corporation. So another international standard is the World Bank Operational Policies. We have a whole lot of law World Bank Operational Policies, but the one that relates to the resettlement planning is the Policies 4.12, which is guidelines on involuntary resettlement. So this guideline governs the resettlement procedure for the public sector project. For the public sector project, remember, uh, I said IFC is basically for the private sector project, but the World Bank operational policies is for the public sector project. So if any project is a public sector project, the basic guideline that guides them is the World Bank operational policies 4.12. But for investors that are um, private sector 
project. So the the guideline is the that guides them is the IFC performance standard five. Also, we have some other international. We have the Af African Development Bank statement on involuntary resettlement, which is stipulated in the African um, African Development Bank document. The, the document is titled guidance on involuntary displacement and resettlement in development project and precisely the chapter four that particular guideline it talks about the environmental considerations and the right of host community so apart from that we also have the european bank for reconstruction and development that, that guide the resettlement planning in the european countries we have the asian development by guidelines that guide the resettlement planning in the asian countries and some other ones, the list continues like that, the list continues like that. So for the national legislation, okay, let's take uh, for a good example of the national legislation is in, in Nigeria that guides the resettlement planning is the subsessions, subsessions one, two, three of the section 29 of the land use at CAP 202 of the 1990 laws, which talk extensively on the rights of the host community and the responsibilities of the investors when it comes to land acquisition and um, and resettlement. Apart from the um, uh, apart from that particular one, we have some other national and state um, state legislations. State legislation. We have a lot of resettlement policy frameworks that cut across different sectors. We have for the power and energy sector. We have for the mining sector and the likes of them. So moving to the um, industries industry specific policies. So these are the um, it is otherwise known as the corporate policies. They are stated by different sectoral organizations that can be used to guide the operations of that industry. For instance, for the mining industry, we have the um, Council for Mining Engineers in Nigeria. We have a particular session of their guidelines that talks about the resettlement action. And in the international scene, we have the International Council for Mining, for Mining and Metals. So that is your that is they have their own guidelines to that guides the resettlement planning worldwide. And then the last category of standards and regulation the regulatory framework is the company corporate policy on resettlement, which is usually stated by individual companies that guides their operation whenever resettlement activity is taking place for that company. So those are the four basic categories of standard and regulatory frameworks that we have that guides the resettlement plan. All right, so let's quickly look at like and uh, look at the objectives, objectives of resettlement action plan. It is good to define the objectives because it will help us to clarify the levels of performance required by companies in relation to resettlement. So, we have uh, the major, the major, the major aim of resettlement plan, basically, and which all other objectives seem to achieve is to ensure that all the project affected persons, and by extension, the communities are compensated equitably, and the compensation must be in accordance with the lo local laws, laws and the international guidelines. So th that is the major overall aim of the resettlement action plan. And some other key objectives are, are on the screen. The first one is to avoid or at least to avoid or at least minimize involuntary resettlement wherever feasible. And this can actually be achieved by first exploring various alternative project designs and locations. So that's the first objective. Also, um, to avoid forced eviction as much as possible, as much as possible. Investors or companies must make sure that the project affected persons are not forced to exit their places of resettlement. Resettlement is actually expected to be carried out in a peaceful and in a manner that is satisfactory to all the parties, I mean, all the stakeholders involved. So a resettlement must not be in a forced manner. You must not force people to evict their, their, their land or their community. Also, resettlement action plan seeks to mitigate adverse social and economic impact resulting from land acquisition or restriction on affected persons' use of land. The fourth objective is that RAP resettlement action plan helps to improve or at least restore the livelihoods and standards of living of displaced of displaced persons. And while restoring the livelihoods and standard of living, 
the investors or the companies now must ensure that the condition of living at the new location must not fall below the condition of living of the locations where these people are being relocated into. So it must always get better. I agree, mean, yeah, it must always get better. It must not fall below the condition which they are coming from. And the last objective for the sake of our time is that the settlement action plan it helps to improve living conditions among the displaced persons through provision of adequate housing with security of tenure at them at the resettlement site. So these are the main objectives and these are the things that the resettlement action plan seeks to achieve. So let's move to the risk and the impact that are associated with poor resettlement actions. If a resettlement action is not well done, what are the things that we expect? Oh, there are many, but they can be categorized into two. We, can, we have the impacts that are related to the community or the project affected communities now. And we have the impacts that are related to the proposed project as well, to the project that we are, we are bringing up. So let's look at them one by one. The impacts on the community now, the impacts on the community. Um, the first is the loss of land. The loss of land, which we definitely leads, leads to loss of buildings, loss of shelters, and other structures on the land. So that's the first impact on the community. The community, the people in the community, they will lose their land. Another impact on the community is loss of jobs and sources of livelihood due to the fact that um, project affected persons have to leave their original location where they are, where, where they are, their jobs and their sources of livelihood. So resettling them will definitely have a huge effect on them, making them to lose their sources of income. So that's the impact on the community if the settlement action plan is not well, it's not well done. We also have that um, it can lead to community unrest or conflict, community unrest or conflict, which might eventually lead to the breakup of the, of the communities that are involved. Conflict might arise between the community members and their leaders, thinking that maybe their leaders has, 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 been, has been compromised. It might also um, arise between the community members and the company or the investors involved. So it is good to say that conflict is usually associated with resettlement actions. But the purpose of a good and effective resettlement action plan is to mitigate all this conflict to make sure that it doesn't generate into a higher conflict. Also, another significant impact of um, poor resettlement plans is the cultural impact on the people, maybe in form of loss of cultural heritages or their traditions, or even their cultural in inheritances. So that's another significant impact. And then um, lastly, and lastly, it can lead to emotional and psychological impact. You know, losing everything that you have worked for over the years, and having to relocate to another to another location, it can create a huge emotional and psychological effect on the project affected persons. These um, negative impacts actually are often particularly severe for some group of people that we consider as vulnerable groups, which include the elderly ones, the physically challenged individuals, the children, and the like. These um, negative impacts are always severe, are always severe on them. And also, apart from the communities, apart from the project affected communities, you know, if a resettlement action plan is not well done, the receiving communities, you know, if 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 you want to displace people from a community, we have to relocate them, uh, relocate them into another community. But if a resettlement action is an uh, action plan is not well done, it might lead to a, a, a form of strain or stress on the on the receiving community now on the receiving community you know maybe a community that have um, that is um, with the population of 50 people before and then bringing some people to join them uh, making them to be to become a population of about 200 they are the social amenities that are in the community might not be able to to be enough for that kind of people so considering all that if that uh, considering all these negative impacts there is need for a, an effective and a good resettlement action plan. So that is the impact on the community. Let's now look at the impact on the project if a resettlement action plan is not well done. The first one is delayed in project implementation. We can be due to the conflict that is caused by grievances from the project and affected persons and the host. And sometimes you can even see that even the nearby communities might disrupt the project activities if they do not see benefits given to them. So that is one effect of 
poor resettlement action plan on the proposed on the project that would um, that would they want to bring into the community. Another significant point list is that you can lead to restriction of future development. If a resettlement action process is poorly done, the investors now or the companies they might face some form of uh, opposition if there is need to expand the project in the nearest future because they might have lost the, the, the trust of the community now. So in the next time if they want to bring another project, some people might, might, might not agree with them. The project and the community people, they might not agree with them that when you are coming the first time, you mm -hmm. not do the right thing. So it might lead to restrictions on future development for that uh, for the investors. Also, you can lead to financial costs that are associated with um, maybe um, legal action. You know, if you do not do the right thing, the community people might take the the company to the court, and at the court you are going to spend money. So that's uh, that's the loss of um, finance. And lastly, risk on the project that you can lead to damage social lessons to operate. You know, as a result of um, agitations here and there from the community members, um, it might lead to reputational damage for the company, both locally and um, and internationally. All right. So that's for the impact and the risk on both the community members and the project that you are bringing on. So let's now go to the procedures. If you want to carry out a resettlement action plan, what are the steps you need to follow? What are the procedures that you need to follow? These procedures, they will be categorized into the three subcategories that you are really looking at today, which is the planning stage, the implementation stage, and the monitoring stage. Under the planning stage, we have a whole lot of uh, a, a whole lot of steps that are under it. We have the legislative review, we have the census, census data collection, we have the socioeconomic survey, we have the asset inventory and valuation, we have the eligibility, we have the stakeholders engagement, we have the entitlement measures and the likelihood restoration. So let's look at these these steps under the planning stage one by one. For the legislative review, the first step. If you want to carry out a resettlement action plan, is to review the legislation or standards that are related to resettlement plan. You know, understanding the, 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 the legal framework and other guidelines that govern land acquisition is essential in developing, in developing plans for resettlement and livelihood restoration. And this stage primarily, primarily consists of um, identifying all applicable international or the, or, the inter, or the standard that we have talked about before, all the applicable ones that are relevant to your project, you have to review them and um, make sure that you, you follow them. As I've said earlier, for private sector projects, the basic guideline, the international guideline is the IFC, the performance standard five of the International Finance Corporation. And for the public sector, maybe for the project, for the project that the government want to bring now, the basic guideline that you follow is the World Bank Operational Policy 4.12. 4.12. So that is the first step when you are planning to do the settlement, the resettlement and action plan. So that's the first step to review the legislative that are relevant and that are peculiar to the project in which you want to bring. And then after that, you now carry out the census process, the census and data collection. Census is just a process of compiling a 100% sample of individuals or household or businesses who will be physically or economically displaced as a result of the project that is coming to that community. And then census is usually carried out through various field investigations and activities. You go to the field, you collect, um, you, you collect data, you, you, you go to the um, people and you collect some form of data. And what are the kind of data that you collect? You collect the list of all owners or users of affected land including the structures or other assets on the on the land you also collect the list of the persons that will be economically displaced by the project the type of business that uh, business activity that is being carried out the list of business employees the monthly profit the employee salary and all of that information about that particular business that we are affected by the project and in cases of physical displacement the census data will include the list of individuals as well who we have to who we have to relocate and then is it it is quite good to state here that in the in case we have some of the data needed for census assist and uh, maybe you can get the 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 data from existing data which we call the secondary data you must also go to the feed to validate what you have collected to find you must do a primary data collection to validate that secondary data that you are so 
you, if you want to do census, you can't just rely on the secondary data that is available. You must also go to the feed to get the primary data and validate the data, the secondary data. And the main purpose of census basically is to list all those eligible for compensation and for other forms of assistance that are resulting from the project needs to acquire to acquire land. So after the census, then you will now do what you know at the socioeconomic survey. The socioeconomic survey is used, it basically is used to determine and analyze the socioeconomic conditions of individuals or household or businesses in the project affected area. And um, sometimes is it carried out together with census, and sometimes it is carried out after the census data have been collected. And basically, this data that is carried out during the census data collection forms the guide for this socioeconomic survey. So it's either census data collection precede the socioeconomic survey or they are carried out together. So that is the, that is how it is being done. And the primary purpose of socioeconomic survey basically is to gain a detailed understanding of the living standard of affected people or households, a, a detailed information about them, their sources of, in, of income, their access to services and infrastructures, their social networks, their preferences for relocation, and some other well detailed um, information. So that is the essence of socioeconomic survey. So and another reason why we do socioeconomic survey is that the data collected through socioeconomic survey serves as a basis for monitoring impacts and evaluating the achieved progress during the monitoring process of the resettlement, resettlement action plan. So after the socioeconomic survey has been done, we now do what is known as the asset inventory and valuation. Asset inventory and valuation. This is just a process for registering all lands and assets that are present in the affected area, which need to be acquired for a project. And then um, asset inventory and then um, valuation provide the number and the value of the affected assets. You know, after you have listed the, the, the you must also take, you must also take inventory of the assets and, and evaluate it. Okay, how much? With this building cost, so that when you want to compensate them, you know how much you will give to them. And some of the information that asset inventory seek to identify are, are, are listed on the screen. We have the land by size, the types of residential structures. If it is a non -residential, residential structure, now for what purpose it is, is it being used for? Is it for storage facility? Is it a storage facility? Is it a, a ban reduced for agricultural purposes? So all kind of um, all sort of purpose. Also, when we have the private enterprises, we get information on them too. We we evaluate them. The communal the communal asset as well. Maybe there is a, a barrier grant. If there is a site for religious activities, so you take evaluation of them. The public structures, we the schools, we really be affected hospital or clinic in the community will it be affected and how much will it cost if you want to displace this particular structure. Also some other form of infrastructure, the road, the bridges, and some other physical assets like that. So these are the list of list of things in which we have to take inventory, inventory on and evaluate it. And then the next slide is talking about the things that we need to do during the evaluation stage, during the asset inventory and valuation stage. Then basically, we record, we measure, and uh, we calculate, but because of our time, we will not be able to go deep into that. All right, so after the asset evaluation and inventory, we now do the stakeholders engagement. And when we talk about stakeholders, the most important stakeholders in when it comes to resettlement planning is the project affected persons or the community, the project affected persons or the community. They need to be involved in offices of resettlement planning and then implementation. And then we have a whole lot of stakeholders that we need to engage. We have a whole lot of them. They are, they are shown on the screen the list of stakeholders that we need to engage. The first, as I've said, is the affected people, the project affected the people, the community. We have the, um, the NGOs, some relevant. NGOs and some other civil society organizations. We have to consult the government. We have to engage the government and the local authorities and the host communities as, as well. They must be, they will have to be engaged. And the main purpose of stakeholders engagement basically is to provide adequate and credible information about impacts and options. 
taking into account the views of various parties that are involved. When you are, you are, when you are engaging them, you tell them what you want to do, and then you receive, you, you, you receive their, their views to their perceptions about the project and about the resettlement, the resettlement action that you want to, that you want to uh, undertake. And after that, we, we, um, we do the eligibility criteria in which we are going to look at the people that are eligible. You know, not everybody that are in the community are eligible for compensation or for um, the livelihood restoration. So we do that. And then after um, dividing the people, the list of people that are eligible, we do the entitlement measures. Like among the eligible ones, who are the ones that are entitled to collect compensation? And then we move on to um, the documentation, which is the record of activities that has been taking place so far. So we document it. This documentation will give us a good idea of steps that clients need to take during the implementation, during the implementation. So that is all about the planning stage, the procedures and the steps during the planning stage. During the implementation stage, which is where we are going to do our resettlement in full, we do the physical and the economic displacement as well as the likelihood restoration. After you have displaced the people, you have to restore their livelihood. So that is what the implementation stage is, is talking about. Is talking about. And then we do the um, restoration. Restoration. And the main goal of carrying out a RAP basically is to restore the livelihood of the project affected persons. And then restore, livelihood restoration comprises a set of different measures which is usually implemented to address um, economic economic displacement. All right, so um, for the monetary stage, basically we have three component of monitoring when it comes to resettlement action plans. We have the input monitoring, we have the output monitoring, and we have the outcome evaluation. Input monitoring is otherwise known as the uh, progress monitoring. And it helps us to measure whether the activities have been delivered as specified in the resettlement action plan documentation. So that is the input monitoring to follow up to make sure that the activities that have been specified has been delivered. And for the output monitoring, which is also known as the performance monitoring, it helps us to measure the results of the inputs that have been delivered. Okay, after you have delivered the input, how well have you done it? What is the um, outcome? All right, so that's for the output. And for the outcome evaluation, otherwise known as the impact evaluations, it helps us to measure whether the delivery of inputs and the achievement of output are contributing to the successful or accomplishment of the objectives which have been set for the settlement action plan. And for us to, be, to have a successful monitoring program, there are four basic things that we must, we must follow. We must make sure that there's adequate database, baseline data. We must make sure that there's adequate baseline data against which to monitor resettlement progress and impact on livelihood. And we must also make sure that there is clear monitoring indicators to assess the performance against baseline conditions. And we must make sure that there is appropriate databases, the uh, reporting and collation system to capture and to analyze the monitoring data as well as an independent monitoring mechanism, which includes the community involvement during the monitoring and evaluation stage. All right, so to round it up for this morning session, let's quickly look at the benefits of an effective resettlement action plan. What are those things that we, 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 we can gain? What are the advantages of an effective Resettlement action plan. The first one is it helps us to improve risk and management process throughout the resettlement process. You know, given the significance of the risk associated with resettlement, resettlement action plan can be considered as a safe guide approach to improve risk management process. Also, it will help us to minimize resettlement impact. You know, we have a, like the impact that we have discussed before, we have a whole lot of them. The resettlement action plan will help us to minimize the impact on the people or on the community that are involved. The third one is that it helps us to improve the collaboration with the government and civil organizations. It helps us to improve collaboration 
with the government and civil organizations, and even the, to improve relationship with the project affected persons. And um, it also helps us to it give us the opportunity to build, it give us the opportunity to build or improve relationship with affected people. And then um, also help us to align with standards and um, re regulations to avoid litigation or legal, legal actions on, on the investors or on the on the company. So concluding in conclusion, in conclusion, unless the settlement processes is properly managed, involuntary resettlement may result in a long-term hardship for the affected communities and persons. It may also lead to the to environmental damage to adverse social economic impact in areas to which they have been displaced. So thank you so much for having me this morning. Over to you, the moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Ojo Sunday, for well, that highly informative discussion. We have been able to get a lot of points. We've been able to gather a lot of points. We received a number of questions from the participants. And, um, I would like to go over those questions now so that they can all be attended to. Okay. Um, I want to believe our first our first uh, contributor is still with us, Mr. Dako. Thank you for staying up to this present moment. I will be the first question I will be will be directed to you. Actually, we had so many questions, so many questions, and um, I'll just go over them quickly. I'll go over them quickly. I had the first person that asked the question would like to know when the integration of community development agreement, that's the CDDA, when is the integration of the CDA while conducting this resettlement action plan process. Over to you, Mr. Dako. Well, thank you very much for that intelligent question. Uh, the integration of uh, community development is at the starting of the project. Immediately you start the project, you have to carry the community along and you have to sit down with the community, discuss all their needs and what you intend to do. And they will tell you also what they want you to do in their community as you go along with your project. So in resettlement, you need to have the consent of the community. In that case, the community has to be carried along so that wherever you want to resettle them, they might not be forcefully ejected or they might not feel bad. But the plans that you have in your project will also have to carry them along so that they will benefit from the project you are initiating. I think if you have any other, uh, if you are not clear, you can ask me. Thank you very Over to you, the moderator.
Thank you very much, Mr. Dako, for that response. Just before I go to the question I have for our second speaker, Mr. Sunday, let me ask this other question. Um, Mr. Dakob, another person, Mr. Nosa, would like to know, he says, in a situation whereby a community refuses to be resettled, what do you do? What is to be done if there is a community that is affected by a project and they refuse to be resettled? Over to you, Mr. Dakob. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you know that in resettlement, it's not only the company that is involved. The government is also involved if it comes to resettlement. When the government sees that a, comp I mean, a project is viable and has that effect that can resettle a community, it is the government that will have to come in so that the, the government will mediate between the community and the company so that the people will not feel it is just the project or the company that is trying to resettle them. And when government comes in, the community belongs to government. Government is the eyes of the community. And therefore, the community has to come to compromise with government to see the need that there is a higher uh, pro project that needs the intervention of government and therefore they, they, they will have to accept and move to a place. The place may not be as where they were, but sometimes you will have to accept the condition as it comes to you. Thank you. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dakob, for that question. Okay, finally, I will take this third question to Mr. Ojo Sunday. Um, the question is How do you determine the compensation for material things? Because you said you talked a lot about um, lands, you know, properties and all of that. Then how do you determine the compensation for material things? Over to you, Mr. All right, thank you. Um, for material things now, when we talk about material things, we talk about things that are not, that we can't see, basically. And um, such type of thing, we can include maybe um, livelihood, may include source of income and the likes. So those are the non-material things. I hope that is what the um, person that asked the question wanted to, wanted to, what he or she meant. All right, so um, during the, when I was making my own contribution for the planning stage, when I was talking about the key steps or the procedures that must be done during the um, settlement action plan, under the planning stage, one of the things I talk about is the asset inventory and valuation asset inventory and valuation. So during this stage, it's not only the structures, the physical things that are being evaluated or that are being taken inventory on. The business, the business owner, that type of business will be taking note of as well, will be evaluated, will be taking inventory on that business and we know what that kind of things worth. So that when we want to compensate them, we know how much we are going to we are going to pay them. So basically, it's not only on the physical um, physical things that is being compensated on. All these kind of non-material things can also be compensated on but based on a well done asset inventory and valuation. That is a key step of procedure during the planning stage of the settlement action plan. Thank you. I hope I've been able to answer the question. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, our time is fast spent. We would not be able to read other questions. We have commendation. Mr. Ibrahim says thank you to our speakers. Miss um, Charity says wonderful presentation. Thank you, our speakers. So on behalf of Rich Flood, I would, the organizer of this event, I want to say thank you to our participants for attending this morning session. We are confident that um, your understanding of the settlement action plan has been broadened. And we want to appreciate our contributors as well, Mr. Dakop,
from the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development. Thank you very much for your active participation in this event and for giving us such an informative presentation. Also, Mr. Sunday, we appreciate you. If you have further questions, please you can forward them to us at info at using info at richflood.com. We thank you for all your commendation, Mr. Jamila. We see all the comments. Um, just before we go, I would like to tell us that we have another session which will be coming up in the afternoon at 3 p.m. So we would like you to also attend this afternoon session as well so that we can listen to some other contributors who will be coming in with so many ideas as well on this resettlement action plan. This is not the end of it. So if you are not able to take your question now, we can take it during the afternoon session. Do ensure that you join us at 3 p.m. for the afternoon session. And um, I would also like to tell us about our next month's workshop, which is on remediation, incorporation, consideration, uh, and um, talking about remediation, mitigation, and all of those things. So it's very, very important for you to attend our monthly workshop. We have different packages that we we bring on a monthly basis and this workshop is free you can access all the materials on our youtube channels please let's put on our videos let's put on our videos for a group photographs let's put on our videos for a group photographs anywhere you have if you are in your office if you are in the house you can call your colleagues to join you let us see your beautiful and handsome faces let's put on our videos for a group photographs Oh, Madam Susan, you look so beautiful. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. We appreciate you. Uh, okay, please send notification to everyone. Send notification to everyone. Our technical team, send notification to everyone to put on their video. Let them start their video let's take a group photographs with everyone at this event and um, start taking the shot as they are showing all their beautiful and handsome faces thank you very much wow wow please put on your videos please put on your videos please put on your videos everyone okay mr okafo Prince Samuel, Mr. Samson, Mr. Ifai, Madam Susan, please put on your videos, put on your videos, put on your videos, let us see you. Please, are we taking the shots so that we can close? Oh, Mr. Prince Aziz. Mr. Rio, we can see you. You look great. You look great. Mr. Adejo Johnson, you look great. Mr. Kolade, Madam Jamila, thank you for your participation. Mr. Shuaibu Tunde, thank you for your participation. Mr. Samson, Mr. Samuel, Wow, you look great. We have important people. Mr. Titus Dakop, we really appreciate you. Madam Adetutu Ogundele, thank you very much. Mr. Ifai Martins, thank you. Mr. Unzewi, thank you. Mr. Eric Daniel, thank you for your participation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. Oh, Mr. Atonda Hamed and your team. I can see your team. I can see your team right there. Mr. Olu James, you look good. You look good. Thank you for your participation. Uh, Mr. Michelia, Mr. Ibrahim Tore. I don't know if I got your name correctly. Uh, thank you for your participation. Mr. Albert Chinedu, thank you. Mr. Abdul Karim Oba, 
Thank you for your participation, Mr. Prince Ijoma. Thank you for your participation, Mr. At oh, Engineer Kiola. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your participation, Mr. Ogunda Reolujide, Mr. Isaac Julius, Mr. Paru. Wow, wow, everybody is looking so great this morning. Um, Madam Fumi, Mr. Okay, Farm, Farm Innovatives. Innovation, thank you for your participation. Oh, the Bois Cement team, thank you very much. We recognize you, Mr. Aminu and his team over there. Thank you for your participation. We hope that you will join us during the afternoon session. Madam Asha, okay, is that Madam Asha Samkura? Thank you very much, Ma. Uh, Mr. Shuaibu, thank you everyone. You have been an amazing participant in this event. We hope to see you again, Madam Susan. Thank you so much. Until 3 p.m. when we shall meet and um, welcome our other um, contributors. The team from New Map, you are recognized. Thank you for your participation as well, Mr. Bachi. Everyone, everyone, Mr. David Ajibwe, we appreciate everybody. Thank you so much for your participation. We hope to see you during the afternoon session um, when you shall come up and then we'll meet with our other contributors who would also enlighten us again on uh, this topic they will share their own ideas their own views on resettlement action plan till then please enjoy your day take your lunch before 3 p.m and get ready for another highly informative session at 3 p.m thank you and goodbye from here thank you